Luke chapter number 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him into an high mountain, showed, him unto, uh, showed unto him all the nations of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered him and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands thou shalt bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, answering, said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for to see them. Okie dokie, we'll stop there. Now, I need to give you a few disclaimers. Uh, quick question. Anybody here today not believe or would argue with the statement that the Bible is the preserved word of God and they are exactly as God intended them to be written? Anybody got a problem with that? Didn't think so? If you do, see me after service. That'll be about an eight hour long Sunday school lesson, but we'll get there. We will get there. Second, uh, anybody have a problem with the fact that God is omnipotent? I mean, he's got all power. Uh, that he's omniscient, that means he knows everything. And that he's omnipresent, that means that he's everywhere at once. Anybody got a problem with those things? Okay, remember that nobody had a problem with that. Because I don't want to get stoned by the end of this. Okay? But remember those two things. Okay? I gave you an opportunity to leave if you didn't agree with either one of those statements. Okay? Now, in this passage, very familiar portion of scripture. Now, I have heard it misrepresented when people have taught or preached out of this chapter that the devil came to Jesus at the end of the 40 days of fasting. That's not what the Bible says. Look in verse number 2. Being 40 days tempted of the devil. The devil's after him from the moment he started fasting. Amen. Why? Because look at verse number 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. In other words, he showed up with more God on him outwardly than had ever been expressed before. He was God. He, he had God all over him because he was God. But just like when he was baptized and the spirit descended in the form of a dove and landed upon him, okay, here he shows back up ready to begin his outward earthly ministry in earnest, and he's just got the power of God showing out on him. Because for 30 years, there were glimpses, like when he was 12 and he went into the temple and he dumbfounded all the scholars and was answering questions that they had about the Bible. Okay, there were moments where he would let a little bit shine through. But here he says, okay, it's the Father's timing. We're ready to go. That's why he went to go fast, to get his you know, body prepared for what was about ready to happen. Because we know he was robed in flesh just like us, but that flesh was just made of the same stuff that we're made of, Brother John. He had to get that thing ready for all the nights that he would go without sleep. And he had to get his body ready for the endeavor that he would you want to track how far Jesus went in three and a half years and tell me that if we did that today we wouldn't be worn out how many times do we through the scripture find him sleeping or resting very few in fact one of the few accounts that we do find him resting in the under part of the ship the disciples went and woke him up during the middle of a storm but right? he went through a whole lot in three and a half years physically and he was preparing he was asking God he was fasting he was saying father Strengthen this corrupt flesh, okay, because he was just made out of dust like you and I. That body couldn't really conceal who he was. You can still tell that he was the Son of God. They said, Never a man spoke like Jesus, right? Didn't his heart burn within us as he walked with us, as he talked with us, right? He spoke, devils were cast out of people because his voice was still the voice of God, 
Right, but when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, that flesh disappeared real quick. Because if he wanted to really show who he was, the flesh would have had to go away. Peter, James, and John looked up and they said, ooh, that, that's really what he looks like. But really, it wasn't what he looks like because God told Noah, no man can see me and live. So that was just a glimpse of what it was. And even in that moment, he looked completely different than what he did in the flesh. Because Peter was so dumbfounded, he just started talking, hey, let's build temples and get something done. Right? I don't know what I just saw, but it was worthy of celebrating. But all that being said, he's in preparation. They're getting ready. Maybe he's praying, you know, Father, thy will be done. I know everything that's going to happen, but I can't do it without the Father. Can't do it without the Spirit, because all three are one. I don't know what he's praying. He went up there to fast for 40 days. But the devil was after him from day one. Not when he hungered at the end of the 40 days. For 40 days he tempted, and then at the end, these were the temptations that are recorded. Okay, and we know. I mean, if you've been here any length of time, if you've been in church any length of time, you've probably heard it preached on all three of these temptations. They're the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Right? The, the Apostle Paul, we are ignorant of the devil's devices. What's he still using today? All three of those. Maybe worded a little bit different. Maybe presented in a different avenue. But that's it. And what are all of them? I'm going to do what I want to do instead of what God wants me to do. If we give in to them. Okay, we're not going to be teaching on that. Okay, I have heard, I would say within the last month, I can't remember exactly when it was. But I heard somebody say, well, the devil doesn't play by the rules. And I'd heard that before. I've heard the devil doesn't play fair. I've heard that. And never had a reason not to, you know, shout along with it. But then I got to thinking. And by I got to thinking, the Spirit spoke to me and said, hey, listen to this. Okay? Three times. Jesus, just like in the uh, other portion of the Scripture, when the archangel was contending with the devil over the body of Moses, didn't bring a railing accusation against him because Jesus could have said, hey, you're a sinner. You were the father of sin. You disobeyed God in heaven. Were cast out of heaven. Right? Get out of here. Could have thrown, you know, sent him back to hell. But hey, wasn't the Father's will for that to happen. Why? Probably so that we could read this and have the example of how to deal with the devil. Three times. Scripture. Then the third time, the devil tried to get a little crafty. Tried to use the Bible against the one who wrote it. According to Psalm chapter number 90. Or 91, sorry. Verse number 11. That his angels would keep him from dashing his foot against the stone. That they'd bear him up to prevent that. Well, all of that. Examples. But nowhere in there. Nowhere in there did the devil play dirty. And with the Lord's help, today we're going to show you. Nowhere in your life has the devil ever broken any rules concerning you. Nor... Has he ever played unfairly? Why do people think that? Well, that's a good question. It's because for too long, people have been coddled instead of being given the truth. Instead of, perhaps, rubbing somebody the wrong way, when really what they should have desired to do was deliver a word fitly spoken, but we're not going to get to that. Instead of telling people what they needed to hear, for too long, people have been saying what they want to hear. I'm not talking just about preachers or teachers or anybody. I'm talking somebody in your life has something happen, and instead of, well, it might take a little bit of time to do that. I know what they're really saying. They're just, you know, maybe like Job's wife, just saying something off the seat of their heart, right, not processing it. They didn't think about what they said before they said it. And I'll just say, yeah, okay, Job didn't do that. He rebuked her. I'll speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we not receive good things at the hand of God? And you? Right? But for too long, people have been blaming the devil for breaking the rules and then using it as an excuse to not confront what has entered their life. So, with the Lord's help this morning, and remember, before we started, you believe the Word of God, 
And you believe that God is God. So, with the Lord's help, we're going to teach on the rules of engagement in spiritual warfare. The rules of engagement for spiritual warfare. Well, what's that mean? These are the rules that everybody has to play by. Okay, now you can ask Brother Charlie. Now, we don't know because we're not allowed to ask him because a lot of the things he can't talk about even though he's been discharged. But if he were allowed to answer some of those questions, I'm sure that at some point they were put on some state of alert, of readiness on this up. Well, there are rules of engagement internationally of things that you won't do. Because according to the Geneva Convention, those things are considered, you know, unhumane or they're considered cruel and unusual. I'll give you one example. They don't have three-sided bayonets anymore. You know why? Well, take that back. Civilized people that abide by the Geneva Convention, they don't have three-sided bayonets anymore on the end of their gun. Because a three-sided wound never heals. You can stitch it together, but there's always going to be a gap. And more times than not, it turned gangrenous or it would get, become septic. And then that person would die it's from a simple stab wound. That if it were a straight blade that only had two edges on it, that would heal rather well. Okay, other things. Chemical warfare. Things like that. Okay, civilians. All of that, rules of engagement. Well, for spiritual warfare, it's the same way. Who said it? God. From the beginning, God's had an order to things. Long before he ever made man. If God didn't have order when he said, let there be light, there wouldn't have been light. Because he has all power, which means he has all control. And his control was set forth in order. What's that? Holiness. He accepts holiness and he rejects unholiness. But when you reject or you don't do ways according to what God said, what is that? That's disobedience. That's unholiness. Because you didn't do what the Holy One said to do. Because he said, that's what's holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. Those are our rules of engagement. We're supposed to do what God tells us to do. We're supposed to do it with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. All the strengths, everything we got, we're supposed to strive to do what God desires us to do. Okay, but too often, we don't think about the rules of engagement that God put in place on the devil. Okay, look with me, if you will, down into verse number 6. This is after he showed them all the kingdoms of the world. All this power will I give unto thee in the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Well, what's that mean? doesn't say that the devil took it. It says it was delivered unto him. And he can give it to whoever he wants to. Wrong. The Bible says that nobody comes to power except it's the Lord's will. That he's the one that sets people on thrones. Now, God may put someone on the throne that the devil wanted on the throne. But it's not for the devil's good, it's for God's good. Perhaps it's so that others can see what it's like when somebody that doesn't know God's on the throne. Perhaps it's so that there's someone on the throne that would listen to the mob rather than the law and crucify his only begotten son. I don't know why God does everything, but I know he does all things well. That his ways are above our ways. Why? Because he's omniscient. And it always gets done because he's omnipotent. But the devil does have rules that he has to play by. And when you say, what well, it just wasn't fair, you're not saying that the devil doesn't fight fair. What you're saying is, is that God let the devil do something to you that you didn't deserve. Or that God let the devil do something to you that you weren't prepared for. Or that the devil cheated. That's not what the Bible says. When you say that, well, that's, you know, he, he doesn't play by the rules. That means that he's got more power than God. That's not true. What you're really saying is, well, when it's unfair, he doesn't play by the rules. What you're saying is, is that God's not big enough to stop the devil from doing what he just did. That's heresy. If anybody taught that from behind this pulpit, they'd be thrown out the door by our pastor before they finished the message. Why? Because if Lucifer had the ability to do things that God didn't want him to do, God wouldn't have been able to throw him out of heaven. As Isaiah wrote, Lucifer, fallen from his former state, cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. 
Why? Because he tried to usurp the throne of God. He tried to do that, but he failed. If that were true, the book of Revelation wouldn't have been able to have been completed. If the devil had more power than God, God wouldn't have been able to bind him for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. God wouldn't be able to, throughout you know, the end time, when he brings them before the judgment seat and then he casts them off into the lake of fire forever, that wouldn't be able to happen. If God didn't have more power than the devil, or if the devil was able to break the rules whenever he wanted, right? Daniel wouldn't have made it out of the lines then. Those three Hebrew children wouldn't have come out of the furnace. Israel never would have left the bondage and captivity of Egypt. In fact, I dare say, if the devil were able to break the rules, Cain would have been the one that carried on the lineage and then that would have nipped it in the bud. Everything that God had shown Adam and Eve and taught Adam on sacrifice, it all would have been lost. But why didn't that happen? Because the devil has to play by the rules. He gives rules. God gives rules to the devil. You don't believe me? We don't have time to read it all. Go over to Job. Chapter number one. Came on a day. Well, on that day, the devil came. God asked him what he's doing. He was walking up and down and to and fro in the earth. He's seeking someone that he may devour, as Peter wrote. Right? Our adversary. That means the one that we're contending with. Someone that's pulling the opposite direction that we are. Okay, now, came on a day. Whatever the devil planned on saying, he didn't get to say that day. God said, has thou considered my servant Job? The devil said he blessed him too good. Then twice, on that day and then on the second day, God put limitations on what he could do, and the devil couldn't break those limitations. You don't think that the first time the devil wanted to smite Job with boils? Wanted to make him so miserable on that first day when his children were dead, when he lost everything that he owned? that he just wanted to quit, but God said, nope. You can touch everything that he owns. Then the next time he said, you can have everything but his life. And both times the devil couldn't break it. Now, does the Bible not say that God is just the same yesterday, today, and forever? So, Job, granted, had a bad day. Had a very bad day. But there is a gap between those two days. You're going to study it out. It failed, or it came to pass on a certain day, the first time, that the devil came before God for whatever reason the devil was going to do to accuse those that you know followed after God. He's looking for imperfections in the people of God. And then God said, Has thou considered my servant? Then there was a the second day. It came fell on another day that God said you can have everything but his life now, do whatever you want just don't kill him there's a gap in between those two days you're telling me that in those two days Job didn't do a little bit of inward reflection asking Lord did I miss a sacrifice was there something that I did wrong when preparing the sacrifices for me or for my children that would cause the sin sacrifice not to be accepted? Lord, am I in your perfect will? He's going back and he's looking, but I, I didn't do this, I didn't, I didn't do that. He's taking inward thought. Now, it's natural to have those thoughts. Right? What in the world is going on here? But our first reaction should not be well, the devil just didn't... It caught me off guard, so the devil must be playing unfairly. Is that what the Bible says? The devil did everything that he was allowed to do. And that are his rules of engagement. He can do everything that God says he can do, and he can't do anything that God says he can't do. So to say that it wasn't fair means that God didn't know what he was doing. Our rules of engagement, very simple. Do what God tells us to do. So, if we're doing what God tells us to do, and that's what Job probably did, you know, so he's inwardly reflected, Lord, is there something in my life you weren't proud with? That I did wrong? Is there something that took more priority in my life than you? But verse number one tells us that it wasn't that way. Job was an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. Perfect in his faith, meaning lacking nothing. So as a result, we can 
infer that when Job went back and did that inward reflection, he said, nope, I've done everything that I was supposed to do. Which is why he was later able to say, Lord, give it, Lord, take it away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because he's saying, I've done everything. To, I'm God's. He can do with me whatever he wants. Because we have been bought with a price. Our life is no longer our own. So is it unfair because God asked something of you that you weren't prepared to give? No. Is the devil unfair and cheating because God touched something that you weren't ready to let go? No. So, let us consider. And this is where it's really about ready to get a little bumpy. I understand. But it's easy to think, well, it's not fair. Why? Let's stay with Job for a second. Why isn't it fair? Because my loved one didn't deserve to die. Yeah. Those thoughts, very easy to come about. Many people get bitter on God. Leave church because someone that they knew or was close to died. But biblically, that's not an accurate statement. And this is where, as we've said, people just trying to consult, being good, to, trying to be sensitive and helping them, saying, you know what, you're right, they didn't. Well, had they ever committed a sin? Because the wages of sin is death. Well, they didn't deserve to die. You're right, they deserved to be in hell from the moment that they took their first breath. But it was only by the grace of God that that didn't happen. Did they know God? Then they're in a better place. Maybe they desired to do something more for God, but God said, I can get glory and honor out of bringing you home. Then glory be to God. It may hurt you. doesn't say you can't grieve. I haven't said that, you know, the grieving process, there is a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That means even when you're broken, you can grieve, you can process it, but you can still say God still deserves the praise and glory for it. But too many people say, well, that just wasn't fair. According to who? You? Are you saying you know more than God? Are you saying that God let one slip through the crack? And I know, not easy to hear. Trust me, harder to preach. Because I'm still looking for stones to start coming in from corners. But to say, well, it wasn't fair to take them. But we have to understand why. Why did they? Wages of sin is death. There's none righteous. No, not one. We are all sinners. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Yes, we deserve to die. But like I said, it's only by the grace of God that that didn't happen before we heard the gospel. Before we received it. But afterwards, this flesh, still appointed unto man, wants to die. The flesh deserves it. But the soul shall never die. I'll be with him. To be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord. Okay, well, if they passed away in the will of God, doing what God wanted them to do, saved and on their way to heaven, who are we to say that God didn't say, good job, you finished your course, come on home to heaven. What you're saying is, essentially, I know better than God. Now here's the very difficult one. What if they didn't know God? Well, the Bible says that there is a point when God turns a person over to a reprobate mind. I don't know when that is. It's probably different for each and every person. But if they died, and you, being able to say, I lived a life before them, that was a written epistle, known and read of that person, that God is the one that they should have trusted in. It's going to hurt, but it's not unfair. They deserved to die long before that. They deserved, you know, hellfire from the beginning. And if God, by His grace, allowed you to witness that person, give them the gospel, yeah, it's going to hurt. Yeah, you're not going to get them back, but that's not your fault. That wasn't the devil taking one too early. If God gave them a chance, 
which the Bible says that man knows in his soul that there is a God. We should, from the moment that we reach the age of accountability, be searching for God, but so many aren't. But if we shine the light and they didn't receive it, that's not on us. That's not on God. That's not on the devil. That was their choice. Okay, let's move on. Nowhere in that is the devil playing by rules that God didn't pin. It is one of those things of order from the beginning. Be not deceived. God is not my, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Sin brings death. Maybe not when we want it, but it's coming regardless. That's why Jesus said, look into the fields that are white already to harvest. We don't know when the wheat's going to fall. We don't know when that plant's going to be time to be hewn down. That's why we just need to go. But just because someone that we didn't expect to be taken is taken, doesn't mean that God's not fair. Doesn't mean that what we've been called to do is unreasonable. What it means is that there's a reason for everything. And just because I don't understand it doesn't mean that the devil's unfair or that he's playing by rules that God didn't authorize. But let's move on before I get stoned. Well, it's not fair because of the financial trouble. It's not fair because, you know, this part that I'm okay with, well, you know, let's be honest. Well, I don't know. Then again, who here could live without Wi-Fi? Everybody's hands should go up. But how many people are willing to go without Wi-Fi? Very few. How many of us could live without electricity? Everybody's hand should go up. Not everybody's will. Right, the Bible says having food and drink to be content therewith. And godliness with contentment is great gain. Now he has blessed us far but pressed down, shaking, bubbling over. Far better than we deserve. But if something were to happen to where, oh no, I've lost that. Or oh no, I don't know where it's going to come from so that I can continue to have everything that I currently have and am comfortable with. What you're saying is, is that first, God's grace is sufficient for you. Just because financial trouble comes, does that mean that the devil has stopped God's grace or weakened God's grace? No. Brother James sings that song, and Sister Renee plays it and sings along with him. There's nothing greater than grace. We shout the house down, but do you believe it? Do you live it? Because according to the rules of engagement, God's grace is sufficient. He can do anything. That means he can remove something from my life if it's for his honor and his glory. Well, you say, well, how am I going to make it? Well, maybe you had too much faith in what you were relying on for you to make it. The devil didn't touch something that God said that he couldn't touch. God probably took it out because you were too attached to it. Because he said, okay, if you want to come to me, this has to be removed out. I remember Brother Randy teaching long ago in Sunday school on be careful what you wish for, and one of those things being patience. And he said he never knew what he was asking for when he prayed for patience. But when we say, Lord, I want to get closer to you, we may not know what we're praying for. But just because something is gone one day, or just because we go to get the next payment or go to put gas in the car, and then we put the card in, it says decline. Well, what happened there? Pull, you know, check the checkbook register. No, it should have money. Go and pull up the online portal. Well, where'd that come from? Why'd that come out on this day? Because God said it needed to. Or God allowed the devil to take it out on that day. But regardless, that doesn't change the fact that my faith is in God. All right, Lord. What now? Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Those that start panicking are going to lose all their hair or probably pull it out. And how many times have we heard a priest or had people testify long before we knew there was going to be a problem, God had already sent the answer. But what are we required to do? Having done all to stand, stand there for as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, endure hardness. We are meant to endure tough things so that the people in the world can see, oh, what they've got actually works. 
If I had a miracle cure-all pill and nobody ever took it, why would anybody believe that it works? If I had something that could fix any problem in your life, but I never gave it to anybody, or I never had anything bad happen to me to prove that what I've got actually works, why in the world would you even care? Stop and listen. But let's move on. Well, that wasn't fair because I wasn't ready for it. Or that was too strong. Something happened, whether people, whether opportunity, whether circumstance. That happened, and it just wasn't fair. Well, I read that God doesn't tempt us. But in times of temptation, he doesn't let us be tempted above that which we are able. What's that mean? He doesn't let us be tempted with something too strong for us to deny. Well, what's that? He tells the devil, nope, can't tempt him with that. Might be able to tempt him with that, but only up to this point. You can present an opportunity for him to step out of the will of God, but stops there. And then he says, oh, by the way, you got to put it in an escape plan. So when you say, well, I wasn't ready for it, that wasn't fair, you're saying that God broke one of his promises to you. That God didn't keep his word. That he loved, let you be tempted to the point where you couldn't resist it anymore. And that would make him an unholy God and our salvation would be worthless. But, in every temptation there's a way of escape. But really what we're saying is, is I wasn't prepared for that. Well, whose fault is that? He gave us the whole armor of God. He gave us everything that we needed to prepare ourselves. So if you weren't ready, it doesn't mean that it wasn't fair. It means that you've neglected your duties. Maybe you woke up that day and you put on the breastplate, but you didn't have your feet shod with the preparation of peace. Maybe you put on the helmet, but you didn't, above all, take the shield of faith with you. But Jordan, that's mean. No, this is Bible. The word is a sharp, two-edged sword. There's a whole bunch of other examples that we could have given. But it all boils down to this. The word is a sharp, two-edged sword, and we started off in the beginning, the rules of engagement, those three-edged blades. Those don't heal. Well, the cuts that the Bible does make to the flesh, God heals them, and it replaces them with spirituality. If the devil did damage to us, never would heal. If God allows the devil to do damage to us, he's got a bomb of Gilead to already heal it. But the wounds that this inflicts, the things that we don't like to hear, the people that, the things that people stop telling others because they didn't want to offend them or they just wanted to be nice to them or they weren't quite sure how to get the point across, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this two-edged sword, when it cuts, God puts something better when he heals us, when he fixes it, when he mends it. Get this out so that I can add more of me in your life. So when somebody says, it's not fair, or, well, that didn't go by the rules, one of three things has happened. One, we need to ask, why did it happen? Remember at the beginning, what's our job? Be in the will of God and to do what God wants us to do day in, day out, second of the day, every second of the day, to the best of our ability. But God does chase in his own. So why did it happen? Like Job, do you take that moment of reflection and say, Lord, have I done everything correct? If yes, then okay, go to box number two. But if not, whose fault is it? It's yours. Because of iniquity, unequal dealing with God, or because of sin. If I sin, I will be punished. Again, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever remains so, that shall he also reap. You saying it's unfair to punish you, but, to not, but for God to go ahead and punish everybody else? That every example of somebody that disobeyed the instructions of God and the ramifications of it, that you're the one exception? I don't think so. So if you're not in the perfect will of God, there's a reason. Well, the first could be iniquity or because of sin because both of them are different. The second one could be because of some form of idolatry. 
Something's become more important in your life than God. And again, you'll be chasing for that. But really what happens there is God shows, tries to show you, hey, you like this thing or you love this thing more than you love me and doing the things that I want you to do and have you know, instructed you to do. So when God touches it, you say, no, 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 I don't want to let go of that. What you're really saying is, that's more important to me than God. Never once did Job say that. Never once did he say, my children meant more to me than God did. My wealth meant more to me than God did. My standing in the community meant more to me than God did. No. God was the most important thing in his life. Daniel didn't say, well, this is unfair. I was taken into jail on trumped up charges. He went with him. Didn't fight him the entire way. All right, this is where God wants me to go. This is where I'm going to be. Those three Hebrew children didn't say, hey, how come we're the only Jewish boys you're talking to? Or how come those people are Jewish? How come they bowed? They're not doing the right thing. It's unfair that I'm being punished. They should be punished. God should strike them down with lightning. Not send me to the furnace. No. But when we say, well, it's unfair because I don't want to let that thing go. Maybe you love that thing more than you love God. And then, final thing, could be because of iniquity. Could be because of idolatry. But maybe it's a faith problem. Without faith, it's impossible to please them. Maybe you had too much faith in what God had given you rather than the one that gave it. Well, it's not fair. I was depending on that. Well, there's your issue. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. But also, he's the author and finisher of our faith. If I'm trusting this to help me do what God wants me to do, I'm trusting the wrong thing. I should trust God to help me do what God wants me to do. And him only. So if God took it, and I was thinking, well, I needed that to do what God wanted me to do. No, he didn't. But you had gotten used to it. It had become convenient to use that to try and do what God wanted you to do. And God's saying, I don't want that to do what I want you to do. I want you to do what I want you to do. And I don't want you to trust in maybe others, maybe in the things that you have. Okay, I'll give this example. Y'all can stone me. As far as I know, I have never claimed my tithes as a tax deduction. This is a personal conviction. This is not Bible. But I will explain to you, biblically, why I believe it. Because in order to do that, in my mind, what I'm saying is, okay, God, you can have this until I need it back when it's time to go pay my taxes. Because as a credit, you're telling the government, hey, you can't do this, which really means I made, in the government's eyes, 90% of what I really made, and then some because of an offering. So I'm lying to the government saying, I don't need to pay you taxes because I didn't make that much, I just made this much. Well, the Bible says, take the first fruits into the storehouse. And then watch and see if he doesn't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on him. Now, I'll take every other deduction that the IRS gives me because they gave it, and I'm going to take it. But I won't take the time. Why? Because I'm saying, well, God, you can have this, and I have faith that you'll get me through till April, and then I'll get it all back then in tax season, and then, you know, it'll all work out, and I'll probably get a nice little refund out of it too. What I'm saying is I trust God with... 90% that he can make that last until I need that other 10% back. Now you say, well, Brother Jordan, again, I can understand how you would look at it and say, well, no, God's just rewarding obedience of getting in the tithe and made it away in the tax law in order for us to get the tax credit for it. That's what you believe. There's no Bible on either one of them. But I just believe I'll trust God with the 90 out of the 100 and then when the Bible says to obey the ordinances and the laws of the land, I'm not going to tell them, well, no, I didn't really make it that much because that's what I made. That's what God blessed me with, and I'm not ashamed of it. So I'm just going to claim it all and trust that God will make that 90, even if i got to pay tax. That he'll make that go a whole lot farther than what I would have been able to make bit and the tax refund and then essentially lying to the government and saying, well, no, I didn't make that much because I gave money away. I didn't give that money away. That was God's money. And he gave it to me. 
because he could trust me to give that back to him. And then he blessed me with this 90, and it's gotten me through the end of the year. That's what I'm claiming. That's what I'm living off of because that's what God gave me. Some people, they, if you can't get over that, that tenth belongs to God, if that 10% means more to you than God in your life, those are the people that say, hey, that's not fair. Where's, where's it going to come from? Or when something happens, well, I guess that means that, you know, I'm not going to be able to tithe this week. Get ready for a rough week. Get ready for a whole lot more trouble. Because the devil does play fair. He has to play by the rules that God gives him. And they're the right rules because he's God. So when we say it's unfair or the devil doesn't play by the rules, our issue's not with the devil, our issue's with God. And it's a heart problem. So the next time that something happens and our, and our first instinct is to say, well, that's not fair, or why did that happen? I'm sure this will be on YouTube at some point unless I said something and Brother Aaron's going to come up to me afterwards and say, well, we can't put this up on the YouTube now. But the next time you have them talk, give it another listen. Everything's fair. And I promise you, on the other side, you'll look back and see why it was fair and God will get the honor and glory for it. But to give the devil credit or to give the devil, you know, some say give the devil his due. No, he doesn't deserve anything. He deserves hell. And everything that he does to me wasn't his design. God allowed it. And I believe that God's going to get me through it or else God wouldn't let it, let it happen to me. He's not going to let me go under so that the devil can get credit for it. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.